Second John this morning, we begin reading the elder that is the apostle John unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth and, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you. Mercy and peace from God, the father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of the father in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we has received a commandment from the father. And now I beseech thee lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning that we love one another. This is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that she, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it for Many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the father and the son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. Thus far, the Apostle John has highlighted the importance of love and truth in the life and the ministry of the church. John writing to this particular lady who apparently housed a local church in her own home. The lady to whom John was writing wanted to show love toward those who came and entered the church and professed to know Christ, but because some were promoting false teaching, because some were straying from the truth, she was apparently uncertain how to balance a demonstration of love with a stand upon the truth. John has laid out in the verses that we read in the early part of this letter, he's laid out the foundational principle that true love always manifests itself by a walk in the truth. That is knowing and then keeping the commandments or words of Christ as revealed in the scriptures. That's what John lays out here in verse six. This is love. Here is love that we walk after his commandments. That is we walk according to the truth. He then turned his attention to the characteristics of the many false teachers who would seek to and continue to seek to infiltrate the church and and propagate their heretical doctrine. And he mentions this in verse 7. Then last week, we considered the consequences of turning from the truth. Remember, in transgressing from the truth. We considered last week from verses 8 and 9, the negative effects, the consequences that come to those who would heed and embrace false teachings and doctrines, teachings and doctrines that are contrary to those laid down by Christ and his apostles and prophets. Remember those consequences we looked at four last week. Number one, failed ministry. Number two, loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Number three, enslavement by doctrinal error. We looked at last week from verses eight and nine. And finally, a break in fellowship with God and other believers who are walking in the truth. These are detrimental consequences that would come to pass to those who gave heed to the false teachings of these heretics who are entering the church. Now, in the final four verses of this brief letter, John turns his attention to the action step, if you will. He tells his readers how to put teeth to the truth. We often put it this way. This is where the rubber meets the road. How to walk in the truth and keep walking in the truth when it comes to a personal conflict with those who are espousing doctrinal error. 
Up to this point, John has been addressing characteristics and concepts and consequences. Now he spells out very clearly in verses 10 and 11, what the believers are to do concerning those who intend to propagate error in the church and why they are to take this action. Here's what you are to do. And here's why you are to do it. In short, this is what we want to consider this morning. They are to separate from false teachers because to aid or encourage them in any way is to associate with error and even thus to participate in their wickedness, to participate in their wickedness. John here in these verses at the very end of his letter finally answers this lady's question and he answers it in no uncertain terms. There's no confusion here. There's no ambiguity here. He lays it out very clearly. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Now keep in mind here, at this time in the history of the church, we need to go back 2,000 years. At this time in the history of the church and the culture of the Roman Empire, it was very common for traveling teachers or traveling philosophers to wander from city to city and seek converts. They needed food. They needed lodging. They needed money. And many of these hoped they could enter the assemblies of people gathering together, including local churches, and draw away disciples after themselves for their own gain. Of course, think about this. Some of these traveling teachers were very good and very necessary. I mean, think about the 11 apostles. Think about the New Testament prophets. And think about the New Testament evangelists like the Apostle Paul and and his team in the early church when he was with Silas and, and with Barnabas and John Mark. I mean, think about these individuals. Necessary, important. Yet many more out there around were dangerous to the spiritual well-being of men, women, and children. And interestingly enough, the danger came from their beliefs and their teachings. What they believed and what they were propagating and trying to push upon believers in the churches. So John commands the believers to have no spiritual or can I say ministry association with any and all who embrace and propagate doctrinal error. And if any association has already taken place, then separation needed to be the course of action. Those who have veered away from the truth are to be Avoided, John says. We need to take a moment here and clarify what we mean when we talk about this biblical doctrine of separation. When we discuss this issue of biblical separation, and we at Grace Bible Church here are a biblically separated church, when we talk about this idea of biblical separation, we're not talking about distancing ourselves in life from anyone or everyone who does not agree with us on every issue. We're not talking here about refusing to befriend unbelievers or even Christians who are not necessarily walking according to the truth. We're not talking about daily interactions with those who do not believe as we do. As we're going to see, and as we clearly see from the context of this letter, when we examine the biblical evidence, the whole thrust of biblical separation is seen in the scriptures, particularly as it relates to other believers or other professing Christians, is association. Associating with another person, church, or ministry in regard to worship or ministry endeavor. Separation ultimately entails saying no 
to joining in ministry or worship with another believer, another church, or another ministry that embraces doctrines that are either unorthodox with regard to the very nature of Christianity or with regard to what it means to engage in a faithful Christian walk that glorifies God. That's a mouthful. But in essence, it says, it entails us saying no to joining in ministry or worship with those who hold false doctrine with regard to the very essence of Christianity or what it means to be a faithful believer in this world today. Now, we have to understand this. It it means we don't join ourselves. We don't associate with churches, Bible studies, other ministries that minimize the importance of doctrine or even propagate false doctrine. Now, keep in mind, there are times in life when it is even necessary for us to separate from those who could be spiritually detrimental to us on a personal level. Biblical separation, as we're going to see, can entail distancing ourselves from those who would influence our beliefs or behavior negatively. The book of Proverbs says much about this. It talks about the fool or the froward. And the need for the believer to separate oneself for one's own spiritual well-being. Sometimes we do need to physically separate ourselves. Even in our friendships, our relationships, when they're detrimental to our physical, emotional, moral, or or spiritual well-being. But generally speaking, as we're looking at this from 2 John, when we talk about biblical separation, we're referring to joint worship and ministry with people, churches, or ministries. I think the biblical doctrine of separation has truly fallen on hard times. The last 100 years have not been kind to this particular teaching. Nobody wants to separate from others who don't interpret the Bible in the same way that they do. Nobody wants to look like a holier than thou know it all who is intolerant, quote unquote, of those who have a different take, if you will, on what God has said to man through his word, the Bible. In fact, being in the Christian world today means at some point you're going to be exposed to the idea that, hey, all who call Jesus Lord, we should just focus on our common savior and ignore the many doctrinal differences that we have. If you're in the Christian world today, you'll be exposed at some point to the idea that we really need to answer Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, that that they all may be one. Despite the fact that this prayer of Jesus was answered on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came to indwell all true believers and continues to indwell those who are truly saved. One will be exposed to the idea that harmony and unity among all who profess the name of Christ is of utmost importance in a day where we need unity because there's strength in numbers against the enemies of the church. But what I want to do this morning is consider whether or not Scripture would support this kind of assertion. Does Scripture support these kinds of claims? This belief that any kind of separation from others who claim to be Christian is unbiblical and unloving, and unity with any who name the name of Christ is truly the right Christian thing to do? Does the Bible say anything about separation, even from others who may be brothers and sisters in Christ? If it does, should we just ignore these texts? Or should we seek to interpret them correctly and live them out in our own lives and in the lives of our church? And what does separation entail? That's exactly what John addresses here. What to do with those who claim to know Christ, but who don't embrace the doctrines that are consistent with the word of God. Remember this lady's question. I want to show love, but I also believe in the importance of truth. How do I deal with this? How do I show love when there's those who come into the congregation and want to teach and embrace doctrine, not according to the truth? John, what's more important here? And this is what we spent the last two months considering. So let's look at John's exhortation to separation here, putting teeth to the truth, the action step that John spells out to this lady in the church who met in her home. Let's let's look at John's exhortation to separation here. First of all, from whom are we to separate? The first part of verse 10. 
those whose doctrine is not consistent with the truth. Notice what John says. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, teaching. Notice, doctrine is the dividing line here. Not personalities, not sincerity. Well, are they sincere or not? Because that's what counts. Are they really sincere? Not, sin- not, not personalities, not sincerity, not good deeds. Well, let's look at how much good they've done. Let's look at all the things that they've accomplished. That's not the dividing line. Doctrine is the dividing line. What do they believe and what are they teaching? We need to understand the importance of doctrine or teaching in the eyes of God. See, the church today wants to downplay doctrine for the sake of some kind of shallow man-made unity. And yet God declares the dividing line to be doctrine. This is God's point of view or man's point of view. How are we looking at life and the church and the world around us? Doctrine is the dividing line. I want us to briefly consider what scripture declares time and again with regard to the need for separation from people. And of course, it's people who comprise churches and ministries and Bible studies, etc. I want to consider what scripture declares time and again with regard to the need for separation from people who embrace or seek to propagate any teaching or doctrine that conflicts with the truth spelled out in the word of God. And notice this, as we look through a little survey of the New Testament here, notice that in every instance, the false teaching did not only entail teaching regarding the person of Christ, that was the particular issue John was addressing here, and we've been looking at that, the Gnostic heresy that had entered into the church concerning the person of Christ. But notice that the false teachings, as we read these texts, surround many different doctrines that have been spelled out in the scripture. Notice, if you will, first of all, Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16. Now, what is the apostle Paul spelled out to the believers in Rome in this book, in the book of Romans? He's, I mean, he starts with the doctrine of sin and he, and he deals with the doctrine of, of judgment and the doctrine of the atonement and the doctrine of justification and then sanctification, how to live the Christian life as a believer, And then he spells out the doctrine of really the dispensational distinction between Israel and the church. And yet the fact that God's not finished with Israel, he's not through with his people, Israel. And then we have all these practical exhortations in verses, I mean, in chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15. And then he comes to chapter 16 and he says in verse 17, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them, that is note Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Doctrine is the dividing line. What were, what were the doctrines that they had learned? The book of Romans is replete with pretty much every single doctrine touched upon in the word of God in just one book, the book of Romans. Doctrine. And avoid them. For, for they that are such, they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. They're satiating and serving their own flesh. And notice this. By good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. By good words and fair speeches. Oh, some will come unto you with, with, with lots of things they've done, lots of good works that they've accomplished, quote unquote, and they will, be, they will be very, very uh, eloquent in the way they come to you and deliver these things. And yet, if their doctrine does not line up with what I have declared to you, Paul says, the things that you have learned that, of course, he received from the Holy Spirit, mark them and avoid them. Separate from them. Turn over, if you will, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6, the apostle Paul says, now we command you, brethren, no uncertain terms here, a command from God himself through the, the pen of the apostle Paul, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. 
and not after the tradition which he received of us. And you say, oh, tradition, well, what is this? Well, go back to chapter 2 and verse 15. Paul defines exactly what the tradition is he's talking about. He says, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught. This isn't some, some, this isn't tradition. This doesn't mean, well, it's just, we've always done it this way. So we need to keep doing it this way. We've always had beige carpet. So we always need to have beige carpet from here on out. No, no, no. What are the traditions? Whether by word or our epistle. That is the things that I have taught to you, Paul says, from my mouth or the things I have written to you. The word of God, doctrine. So this is the traditions he's talking about, not the way in which we use it today. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Withdraw yourselves even from other brothers who are not making much of doctrine and abiding by the doctrine that we have laid out from the word of the Lord. You can go over to verses 14 and 15. Paul says, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, that is the very truth that Paul has laid out. Note that man have no company with him that he may be ashamed yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. There's not time to deal with this this morning, but it's very important the way we go about this. We, we don't count others as enemies. But we need to take a stand and say, no, I cannot associate with you in worship and ministry endeavor because of what you are believing and propagating. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says in verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I understand many take this as a reference to marriage relationship, and it certainly can relate to the marriage relationship. But as we're going to see, I think Paul in context is talking more here about a yoke, the idea of a working, not a marriage relationship, a working ministerial relationship together. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That is those who have not been saved through nothing but faith alone in the person and work of Jesus Christ for their eternal well-being. Those who might come to you and say, no, salvation comes through some worker effort of your own. Don't be unequally yoked together with them. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? We're familiar with this. What communion hath light with darkness? What argument? He, he goes through and gives all these things. And, and he says in verse 17, wherefore come out. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And here's something even better than the, than the, the, the union with, with unbelieving man in ministry. I will receive you, God says. I'll be a father unto you. You shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. The promises of what? That if you separate in, in, in ministry or marriage, if you separate from those who are not walking according to truth, who don't even know the Lord, that I will receive you. You'll be on this, this path of truth as we've been looking at in 2 John with me. We'll be on the same path together, God says. I'll receive you. You'll, you'll, you'll have a fellowship with me that is precious. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, here's Paul's exhortation. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Notice this and spirit perfecting holiness that is set apart in a separation in the fear of God. Because we fear God and love him, let's not be partakers of those who have said no to him, who embrace and teach doctrine contrary to his word. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, we read this wonderful exhortation that we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here it is again. The foundation is doctrine. It's the word of God, correctly interpreted and understood, rightly divided. But in contrast to that, shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. We kind of looked at this last week, this snowball effect, the, you know, becoming enslaved by false teaching and false doctrine. And in fact, their, their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is, Paul names names, Hymenaeus and Philetus, 
who concerning the truth, here it is, the truth, doctrine, have erred. What have, what have they erred? They said the resurrection has passed already, and by doing this, they've overthrown the faith of some. So Paul goes on and says, we're to purge ourselves. We're to purge ourselves from false, verse 21, false teaching and false teachers, if we want to be meet for the master's use and prepared to every good work. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. I know we're jumping back and forth, and I don't know why I did it in this order. It would have been easier just to start from Romans and gone. But anyway, Ephesians 5.11. Paul says that we are, we're sometimes darkness, but now we're, we're light in the Lord, verse 8. So walk as children of light. In verse 11, he says, have no fellowship that is communion with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Over and over and over again, we see this need for separation and doctrine as the dividing line. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and 2 Timothy 3, where this is a familiar text, we looked at this before, Paul says this, know that in the last days perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, here's a huge list, and then he says in verse 5, all of this is going to have a form of godliness, yet deny the power thereof, from such turn away, turn away, separate, get away from it. Second John and our text in verses 10 and 11, the apostle John, of course, is making very, very clear in no uncertain terms here. If they're coming any unto you, bring not this doctrine, receive them not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. He that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. And you say, well, is that the only time John talks about separation? No. He talks about separation in his first epistle, but he also talks about it in his letter to the seven churches in Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. In Revelation 2, 14, it, writing to Pergamos, Christ is telling this church through John, I have a few things against thee. Thou hast there, you church in Pergamos, you, you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. You're allowing them there. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit fornication. So, so hast thou also them, uh-oh, that have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, God says, which thing I hate. Strong language. It's very negative. I know it's negative according to the world standards today. He says, I hate it. Repent, that is, change your mind, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Notice, if you will, his message to Thyatira down in verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Christ is saying, I hate this, and I have it against you that you are allowing those in your congregation to embrace and propagate false doctrine. And notice in all these instances, this reality of the propagation of false doctrine, there are very negative spiritual implications for those who are listening. If one is to view life and ministry through the lens of the world or from any human point of view, then it may seem very unloving to practice biblical separation from others. Yet from God's point of view, this is vitally important for our own well-being and for the well-being of others. It's not unloving to say no, to distance ourselves, to withdraw ourselves, to turn away from all these different terms used in Scripture. Those who are teaching and promoting and embracing and propagating doctrine that is inconsistent with the truth, the truth, and the walk of truth, which we find in the word of God. Verse 6, again, of 2 John. Remember, remember this. Keep this in mind. I think it's the key, not only verse, the key phrase. This is love. This is love. That we walk after his commandments. That's love. So from whom are we to separate? We're to separate from those whose doctrine is not consistent with the truth. What does this separation entail? We find that in the latter part of verse 10. It entails refusing to associate or support these people in any way at all. Notice verse 10, the latter part. 
receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. What does this separation entail? Number one, don't give them an audience. Don't give them an audience. In other words, don't give these men or these women or these people a platform and allow them to teach in any capacity in your local assembly. Oh, but they seem so nice and they come and they want to share what the Lord has told them or the Lord has laid on their heart. And we just want to, we want to have them come on in. Do not give them an audience if their doctrine is inconsistent with the truth of the word of God. Receive him not into your house. Do not aid them or unite in ministry with them. Notice here the very idea of receiving them not into your house carries the idea of any connection with them. Any connection. That could involve giving them money, hearing what they have to say, ministering alongside them, worshiping the Lord with them, studying the Bible with them. You know, I think this is one of the major problems with the denominational or cooperative structure of of most Christian churches and denominations today is that that our our, our money, our time and effort goes to some some greater denomination or something that is that is absolutely out there supporting people who are embracing doctrines completely inconsistent with the truth of the word of God. God's counsel through the apostle John, through the apostle Paul, through the apostle Peter, God's counsel through his word is not see how far you can walk with them. See how close you can agree with them. Find how much you can agree on. What's God's counsel? Don't even let them in the door. Don't let them in the door. Do not give them an audience. Do not aid them. Do not unite with them in ministry. Don't even encourage them. See the last part of verse 10? Neither bid him God speed. In the first century, to wish someone God speed didn't mean to simply say goodbye, you know, as we say today. All right, see you later. You know, have a good one. It carried the idea of wishing them well and encouraging them along their way. In the Greek, the idea is to be joying or rejoicing. I mean, you're really encouraging them. You're wishing them well. You're, you're throwing yourself behind them and say, rejoice and, and be joyful on your way as you do what you're doing. It's to put a stamp of approval on someone and their work or their journey and thus to become an encouragement to them. Yet God makes it clear that separation entails not giving any blessing, not giving any encouragement to one who is doing spiritual harm to others. That's what this separation entails. Don't give them an audience. Don't aid them. Don't unite in ministry with them personally, financially, ministerially in any way. Don't encourage them. Why is separation so important? Well, look at verse 11. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Why is it so important? Because the spiritual well-being of the faithful Christian is at stake. The spiritual well-being of the faithful believer is at stake. He that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. You realize, friends, God only wants what is best for you. He only wants what is best for us. And he knows that to embrace false teaching or to fellowship with those who do is detrimental to the believer. You know, we often are so focused on the surface. We just look at what's physically best for somebody else. And yet God goes so much deeper. He's saying, I want what is best for very you. Your totality of you, who you are. John has already spelled out the consequences of turning aside from the truth in verses 8 and 9. We also know from many other places in scripture that we're not to be deceived. First Corinthians 15, 33 for evil communications. That is your, your associations, your companionships, corrupt good manners or godly living. This is the principle here throughout scripture. Sin is pictured often as leaven in which only a small amount can negatively affect the whole 
God knows this. We often use the illustration of a bad apple. It just, it just takes one bad apple in a, in a big bowl of eight to infect all the rest. All the other seven apples aren't going to make the bad apple good. The exact opposite is going to happen. Or same with mold. You know, you have a moldy orange. And it's like whenever you get a moldy orange, I don't, I, I don't eat fruit hardly, but I should. But I'm just, from, from, from experience and looking at them, you know, you, 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 you pull the moldy orange out. And then you also have to pull all the oranges that the moldy orange was touching. I mean, the ones on the far outside might be okay at that point, but leave it in there long enough, it'll infect it all. That's sin. That's the principle. Even more importantly, God spells out the principle of guilt by association. As we just noticed in the first century, to wish someone Godspeed didn't mean to just say goodbye. It carried the idea of encouraging them in their walk, encouraging them in their work. It's to put a stamp of approval It's interesting today how so many believers, and we do it too, we all do it. We try to justify our compromise. Believers try to justify their compromise with churches or ministries or Bible studies by saying, just because I'm involved doesn't mean I ascribe to everything that's believer taught. Just because I'm a part of this doesn't mean that I buy into everything. In other words, I'm not guilty by association. We can tell ourselves that all we want, yet that's exactly the opposite of what God declares to be true. To minister with or to even encourage one who has veered from the truth is to associate with their error. It's interesting because even in the secular world, we recognize the principle of guilt by association. The person driving a getaway car in a bank robbery, they aren't the ones that went into the bank and held the guns at the teller's heads or they, you know, but, but they're going to be prosecuted. They were guilty by association with those who were doing evil. But for some reason in the spiritual realm, we want to deny the reality of guilt by association. This is to our own spiritual detriment. So John concludes his letter by stating that he has much more to write but he wants to speak with this dear lady face to face. Verse 12, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink. And we say, oh, I wish he would have kept going, right? Apostle John, I, I, want, I want to know, I, I wanted what else? But I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full What we have in the scripture before us is the inspired text that God wants us to know and obey. We might say, I want more. Keep going, John. And yet this is written just for us, just what we need to know. Excluded the things that we don't need to know. This is exactly what God wanted us to have, to obey, and to apply. Love and truth are vital components of the Christian life. Yet true love is manifested by knowing and obeying the truth. Putting teeth to the truth, sometimes through separating from false teachers and false teaching. Don't aid or encourage them. Don't house or feed them. Don't give any impression of helping or blessing them in their efforts. No, no, notice here, there's no, there's no command to persecute these false teachers, like to go on the offensive. That's not the idea here. But rather, there is a command to separate from them and keep them at bay. Don't assist them in any way. The same message is true for us today in the 21st century. And this message is for our own good. Say, Lord, help us to look out for one another, the spiritual well-being of one another. By making sure that what we come together to study here is truly what God says, truly what he means, truly applying it the way that he would have us apply it to our own hearts and lives. Lord, our prayer, protect us. Protect us from the many out there who desire to have us follow and listen to them for our own spiritual detriment. Help us, Lord. Help us as we come together to love one another more to love you more, to be the kind of lights out there in the world that we need to be 
not to praise us, not to magnify us, but to magnify the Lord who loves us and saves us. And we can do that as we go forth into this world and we serve as lights and ministers to a, a lost, a dying, and a dark world. We, we, we need this. I need this. Dave oftentimes reads the mission and purpose that's on the back of your bulletin of Grace Bible Church. And you know, it, it coincides so well, I believe, with Second John. The mission and purpose of Grace Bible Church of Fresno is to glorify God. That's the mission, to glorify him. How? By faithfully equipping believers. That's you, I trust, this morning. To go out into the world and do the work of the ministry. That's Ephesians chapter 4. Do the work of the ministry as, as we fear God and are in fellowship with him. The work of the ministry entails ministering to the lost and edifying and exhorting the saved. As we build relationships and serve as ambassador of Jesus Christ in a dark world. I want to be a good ambassador. A representative. And for that to happen, I need to say, Lord, help me to be walking in truth with you and showing that to the world. And part of that involves not associating or identifying with any kind of doctrinal error. Help us, Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time you've given us to consider this wonderful short letter these last six weeks. Lord, I pray that you would help us to really put teeth to the truth as the Apostle John exhorted this lady and, and her children to do as well and the church that met in her home. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to always speak the truth in love, not only rooted, rooted in love, but Lord, also help us to, to do it in a loving manner. As the Apostle Paul prayed to the, uh, for the Colossians, Lord, help me to speak how I ought to speak, to minister how we ought to minister in all things, pointing others to you, your goodness, your grace, your mercy that you bestowed upon us. Help us, Lord, as we make our way from here today to put you first and foremost above all things for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.